welcome to American Free Thought. I'm John Snyder. And I'm David Driscoll. This is show number 244. We interview Bart Ehrman, author of Jesus Before the Gospels, how the earliest Christians remembered, changed, and invented their stories of the Savior. Hello, Bart. Welcome back to the podcast. You're actually a a rare (laughs) three-peat. We haven't had too many guests (laughs) suffer through us three times, so thanks for coming back on. Yeah, what was I thinking? I know. <laughs> we, had to, we had to bully your publicist. I that see. was how we, we got you back. Right, right. <laughs> the title of your new book is Jesus Before the Gospels. And, of course, Jesus existed before the Gospels were written. But why is that important? Aren't the Gospels pretty much just eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus? Uh, well, no, in fact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. I, I, uh, what I point out in the book is that uh, we, have, we have really good reasons for assuming that they were not eyewitnesses. Uh, the Gospels are usually dated between uh, the year 70 or so for Mark, 70 CE, and Gospel of John. That would be our first one. Our last one is probably John, written around 90 to 95 CE. But Jesus would have died around the year 30. So the point of this book is that there was between 40 and 65 years uh, between the time of Jesus' death and these uh, earliest accounts of his life. Yeah, there is a, a big gap in there. And we've talked about it when we've interviewed you before, how the, the changes between the original, original Gospels and by the time you get to John, it's just he's kind of built up on everything in so much more flowery language and it, how how interesting it is that they've changed over the time and that of course they weren't actually written by Matthew Mark Luke and John. That's right. And so what this what this book is interested in is um is how people were telling stories about Jesus before the gospel writers got a hold of those stories. And so since these gospel writers were not disciples of Jesus themselves, they they're recording things that they've heard. And my question is, how how were people telling their stories about Jesus over all those decades? And the the way I approach it is by asking, how does memory work? Uh, how how do we remember things? How do we remember what we've seen and heard? And how do we remember what somebody told us? And then uh, when we tell it to somebody else, how do they remember it? And how does that go on for forty or fifty years? Right. right. Considering the first one, like you said, was written quite a bit after. And we'll, we'll get into your book a bit. But one of the things that I, I thought was interesting, your your audience, of course, is going to be divided between believers and non-believers. Now, obviously, from a, a selling standpoint, you want to reach as many people as possible. But do you think about that much when you're starting to write a new book, who your audience really is going to be for a book like this? Um, you know, I don't, I don't usually think about uh, the contrast between believers and unbelievers. I, I really think about the audience in terms of what kind of education level will, will my readers have and how much background will they have and how much how much will they how many assumptions will I be able to share with them and how much do I need to tell them uh things like that and what I try to do is make a convincing case for anybody who's open minded whether they're a believer or not so that I don't I definitely don't try to exclude either believers or unbelievers uh when I write I really just try to make a good historical case yeah Bart you we, you mentioned earlier that um you're you're interested in how people pass these memories down about Jesus until the point where they actually entered the written record at the risk of being overbroad i think the theme of your book is and you can correct me with if i'm wrong <laughs> but it's it's how memory is created how memories and even you know personal memories can change over time and may not have been accurate to start with how memory is passed on from one person to the next and how collective memory can be altered by either current events or unfolding history. Yeah, that's right. And, and so it's about how memories, um, how memories are passed along, how we, how we remember things and misremember things and, and uh, how we have distorted memories and how uh, sometimes we invent, invent memories. And, you know, the changes in memory, uh, they're extremely well documented by cognitive psychologists and by uh, anthropologists. Um, and so my interest is in seeing what these other fields of study can tell us about memory and then applying those to uh, our, our evidence for what the early Christian storytellers were doing with their memories of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And are these memories, are, um, th- this research into memory and how it works, um, is this something that you think is 
underutilized in biblical studies? It's completely underutilized. And I'm not unusual. I, I'm absolutely typical where for years I said things about uh, – I said things, for example, about oral cultures. I used to teach about how oral cultures worked and how uh, oral cultures remember things better than we do in our written cultures because since they're oral, they have to remember things better. And, and it never occurred to me that I should read up on research on oral cultures. <laughs> yeah. And so – uh, I think one problem with uh, New Testament scholars is that they tend to be isolated from other fields, and they they make assumptions about things that there actually is good research on, and so it, it's worthwhile uh, actually reading the research. And when you do, it's it's quite eye opening. Yeah, and you you talk in the book about when you mention oral cultures that there are certain assumptions apparently that scholars have made over the years, and one of them is that. In illiterate societies, which are, by definition, oral tradition societies, there's an assumption that things get passed down more accurately from person to person because that's the only way they have to do it, and, and it's more critical that they get it right, and therefore they do get it right. Yeah, that, that, that's right. That's, that, is the, that is a general assumption among a lot of New Testament scholars, and, mm. uh, and it turns out that it's wrong. Um, we know <laughs> Okay. This. Well, we know this because uh, cultural anthropologists have been studying oral culture since the 1920s uh, in places where there isn't isn't extensive uh, writing, but there is extensive storytelling. And uh, they've studied oral cultures in Yugoslavia and Rwanda and Ghana and, and a lot of different places. And all of these studies all point to the same phenomenon, which is that in oral cultures, when stories and are told and when traditions are passed down, it's simply understood that they will change each time that they're told because the storyteller or the person passing along a tradition is trying to make this material relevant for the current audience. And so he takes into account uh, who's there and uh, what their background is and how much time he has and what he wants to emphasize and all sorts of things so that every, every telling of a tradition, in fact, is a, a reconstruction of the tradition. Yeah, you even said in the book that... Um Oral accounts are, uh, are, quote, among those who knew someone whose cousin had a neighbor who had once talked with a business associate whose mother had, just 15 years earlier, spoken with an eyewitness who told her some things about Jesus. Yes. This, this, so this sounds like the game of telephone. Well, it is kind of like telephone. You know, I... I've had I've mentioned the game telephone in some of my writings before, and I've had some New Testament scholars object to it, saying, "Oh no, no, it's it, it's not like that at all." And you know they're right; it's not like that. It's worse than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's not just a matter of guessing about this, but we we know from based on uh, very solid studies that um, that in fact traditions get changed uh, radically, radically get changed. Uh, and so uh, if that's the case now in oral cultures, is there any reason to think that it was different back then? Well, that's something that obviously has to be considered. And so, uh, so what you need to do is look into the uh, traditions that we have uh, from antiquity to see whether it looks like they've been changed or not. And so a good bit of my book is showing how stories in the New Testament are almost certainly changed in the process of their oral transmission. Yeah, they are. And one of the great examples that you give is of the death of Judas. You have one in Mark, then you have in the book of Acts. And of course, you study even the other uh, Gospels that didn't quite make it into the Bibles, like the Gospel of, of uh, Nicodemus. And uh, there's a story about uh, Judas dying in the uh, church father Papias that is completely different from either the Gospels or, or Acts. And and so uh, when people are telling people are telling stories about Judas, they're remembering him in different ways. So it, it just becomes crystal clear that that's going on when you see what these traditions look like. One of the things you touched on was about how historical events can change the color of of how things are remembered and recorded. And I think one of the examples was how the earliest accounts of the earliest written accounts of Jesus that took place, say, or that. The earliest accounts that were written before the, the war with the Jews, before the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, are somewhat different than the accounts uh, about Jesus that are after that war. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, one of the firm findings of uh, cognitive psychology when it comes to memory is that our present circumstances affect how we 
construct what happened in the past. Every memory we have is a is a kind of a construction because the different different parts of our brain um, bring together little bits of a memory to to help us recall what had happened. And when we're in a social group, the social group affects how we remember things because people tell their stories with each other and then they remember things differently depending on how somebody's told the story. And so stories get changed in a lot of present circumstances. And you can see this uh, quite clearly with the Gospels uh, with respect to to Jesus' trial before Pilate, for example. Uh, In the Gospels, uh, if you line the Gospels up chronologically, and um, uh, so Mark would be first, then Matthew, then Luke, then John, and then you go into these later non-canonical Gospels. Pilate gets increasingly innocent. Uh, he's, uh, as time goes on, the, Pilate starts declaring that Jesus has done nothing wrong. When you get to the Gospel of Luke, he says it three times. Uh, later, in later Gospels, Pilate not only thinks that Jesus is innocent, Pilate actually converts to be a, become a Christian. <laughs> and, right. And in one part of the, in the Ethiopic Church, uh, Pilate is said to have become, well, he did become, he became a, a Christian saint. And so you, you wonder, why are they remembering Pilate like this? I mean, Pilate absolutely was a ruthless, mean-spirited, uh, hard-nosed Roman governor who didn't care at all about Jesus. At, or, I mean, he condemned him to, be, to death. So what... Well, what's that all about? So what it's about is this. If Pilate is innocent, who's guilty? It's those damn Jews. Right. The Jews did it. <laughs> and so why are Christians remembering that Jews are the ones guilty for killing Jesus? It's because these Christians who are telling the stories in these later decades are themselves in conflict with non-Christian Jews. Really, we don't have to even go back to the New Testament to see examples of of this sort of thing uh, happening uh, in history, and one of the examples is Abraham Lincoln, who was just despised during his life as a dictator and overhanded and and you know incompetent yokel. But no sooner that he gets assassinated <laughs> than a process begins to where today he's the closest thing that you could imagine to a, an American saint. Well, that's that's right, and there uh, I actually talk about Abraham Lincoln a little bit in the book, as you know, because he's a good example of how your social context affects how you remember the past. But during the civil rights movement, uh, Abraham Lincoln obviously was a was a major hero, uh, but books written uh, in more recent times have pointed out how a lot of things that Abraham Lincoln said were so opposed to anything that we think of as politically correct when it comes to issues of race. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it just it kind of depends what your context is uh, with respect to how you remember him. And, and we, you even discussed that in, in when you were talking about how moving to the South was a bit of a, a shock for you in relation yeah. to how people remember the Civil War. Yeah, well, and, I mean, I, you know, when I, I was I was an innocent northerner when I, I moved down here from New Jersey. And the first time I heard that the Civil War was the war of northern aggression I thought somebody was joking, <laughs> but it turns out that's actually how they think about it down here. <laughs> that was so strange for me, too. I, I grew up in, in the north. I grew up in Maine, and then when I moved to Atlanta, I moved a, a little further south than even you were in, and then, yeah, it was that was kind of a big shock to me, too. It's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's how people that's how people remember it. You know, and it's not that that's an invalid memory or that my older memory is, a, you know, more valid or invalid. It's just in a different social context, you, re- you remember the past differently because of the social group that, you, that, you, uh, that you're involved with. Absolutely. And we talked earlier about how believers versus non-believers in the audience of the book, and that it's not something that you, you think about. But one of the things that believers probably find disturbing is something that you say that I completely agree with. Essentially, the historical Jesus did not make history. The remembered Jesus did. So that's just one of those things where a a believer, a true Bible believer who is a Bible literalist reading this book would go, oh, wait a minute, you mean the Bible is not really literate? Yeah, I know uh, there are people who would be upset by that, but in fact, what I'm by saying that, what I'm what I'm saying is that the fact that um, the Gospels sometimes present non-historical information does not ne- is not necessarily a bad thing. That we need to realize that that uh, the, 
the Jesus that guides people's lives now is not the historical Jesus. He's not the Jesus that scholars have constructed as a historical figure. Uh, in fact, it's the way Jesus is remembered in communities of faith. Uh, and that I, I argue that's not necessarily a bad thing, that, and it's not a negative thing. It's simply the way things are, that, that uh, when, we, when we live our lives, we live according to the way we, we remember the past. We almost never go around fact-checking to make sure that we're right. Uh, it's just we have these memories, and they affect how we live, and that's true for memories of Jesus as well. Even though that's changing lately with the internet, I, <laughs> I, swear, I really think of stuff before I, right after I'll say something now, I'll be like, you know, I can actually check to yes. see if that's true. Yeah, or not. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you can only check to see if somebody else says it's true. <laughs> that, that's a good right. point. That's a good point. Well, and um, Bart, you do point out in the book that when we talk about the difference between the historical Jesus and the remembered Jesus, um, there's a couple of cases where you break down from the from New Testament sources and I guess other sources, uh, the things that we kind of can know about Jesus, you know, uh, yeah. like some people, there are people who say they don't think Jesus existed at all, but I think your argument is that um, there's enough evidence to point to some sort of apocalyptic preacher who stirred up yeah. trouble in Jerusalem and got executed for his troubles. Yeah, one of one of the things I argue in the book is that um, when it comes to memory, um, the researchers in this field have long argued that a gist memory is often uh, more accurate than the details. So you you may you may not remember um, exactly uh, what you did uh, on day three of your vacation last year. Uh, you may not get the details right, but you pretty well remember. The the vacation and you remember where you went and who you were with in most cases, not always, but mm -hmm. often. Uh, so the gist memories often are more accurate than the detailed memories. And so in the book, I try to lay out what we can be reasonably certain about in terms of the gist memories of Jesus in the gospels, both gist memories about his life and just memories about his death. And then, but then I go into a lot of the details to show that some of the favorites and most famous stories about Jesus, in fact, are, are, uh, are, problematic and appear to be distorted memories rather than accurate memories. Mm -hmm. and we touched earlier on the, the difficulties of transitioning information from an oral tradition or an illiterate tradition to a written tradition. Um, and if that, if that weren't complicated enough, you point out in the book that, quote, the disciples were lower class illiterate peasants who spoke Aramaic. The Gospels were written by highly educated Greek-speaking Christians 40 to 65 years later. What are some of the problems that might be peculiar to transitioning oral traditions that came from one language and ended up being written traditions in another? Well, that's, yeah, so it's a long process. And so people, you know, I think a lot of people just imagine that the Gospels descended from heaven a few days after Jesus died. And, uh... It's really complicated because you have the you according to the New Testament itself, the followers of Jesus are these uh, are these peasants from Galilee who are fishermen and and you know day day laborers and and they speak Aramaic uh, as did everybody in in that part of uh, Palestine at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they pass along their stories as they remember them, the, the things that they remember Jesus said and did, and those stories get passed on to other Aramaic speakers, get passed on to other Aramaic speakers, and eventually uh, they get circulated in Greek-speaking circles, and eventually educated people hear these stories, and they pass on the stories. And at every stage, the stories necessarily are being changed. And so one of the big tasks is, uh, is seeing how the stories have changed, and one of the things that scholars uh, do sometimes uh, when they've got nothing else uh, going on on a Friday night is uh, to take one of the Aramaic sayings of Jesus and translate it back into Greek and see if it makes any sense. <laughs> okay. Oh. And so that that's an interesting thing to do because sometimes uh, sometimes uh, uh, if you if you go either way, so you've got the Greek saying, so you translate it back into Aramaic. And then you see, you know, does it work? Can it translate into Aramaic? And if it translates into Aramaic, how do you explain the translation from Aramaic back into the Greek? <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes the sayings make no sense in Aramaic, and sometimes they make better sense in Aramaic. Uh, and so uh, if it makes better sense, you can get some insights into what the saying actually probably was. If it, 
if it doesn't make any sense at all in Aramaic, then probably Jesus didn't say this. You also focus in the book on how difficult it is to preserve. Of course, a lot of this is, I don't want to say academic like it's a bad word, but <laughs> it's its academic in terms of um, we can't really identify any Old New Testament texts that are simply the written memory of somebody who actually was a first-hand witness to something. It's all second and third and fourth hand. Who knows how many how many minds yeah, was, and mouths it passed through. Well, that's right. I mean, I would say at best. I mean, the, the only thing, what I argue in the book is that the only thing even close to an eyewitness is the Apostle Paul. So we have, we have seven letters that, that almost certainly Paul himself wrote. And Paul knew Jesus' brother James, and he knew uh, Jesus' disciple Peter. And so Paul, he's not an eyewitness. He, he didn't know Jesus during his life, but Paul knew two eyewitnesses. So that would be good. So that, that's the good side. Uh, the bad side is that Paul never says very much about Jesus. <laughs> and so, right. And so it's nice that he was close to an eyewitness, but he doesn't tell us very much. And so um, uh, it would be great if he would tell us more, but he doesn't. So, uh, but at least he's, you know, at least he's relatively close to eyewitnesses. Right. And but of course, as if things weren't complicated enough, you also point out that uh, uh, you say uh, it is possible that some Christian storytellers invented stories that invented stories. That's the emphasis. <laughs> uh, yeah. Invented stories that they passed along to others. And so now we're out of the realm of memory completely. Well, I, what I'd say is uh, we're yeah <laughs> right. So. When, when somebody invents a story, it, the, the first thing to say is this happens all the time. I, I mean, all of us hear gossip, gossip and rumors regularly, and whoever starts a rumor is making something up. It, it's not necessarily the case that they're trying to deceive anybody. Sometimes people just get things mixed up in their heads, and they tell something that just, just ain't so. Uh, but you, rumors start all the time, uh, and that happened with Jesus, too. People told stories about Jesus that simply didn't happen. And so to that extent, those stories are not the storyteller's memory, but they can become the memory of the person they tell the story to. In other words, uh, they become Christian memories of, uh, of Jesus, not in the sense of the people remembering, actually, you know, recall Jesus saying and doing these, but, but this is how they're calling back to mind the things Jesus said and did. And that, that's what memory means. Memory means to call something back to mind. And so you don't have to have experienced it yourself to call it back to mind. So these stories that were invented do enter into Christian memory, even if they didn't originate as the memory of eyewitnesses. If it's not too personal, I wanted to, to bring up your, your dedication of your book to your friend uh, Daryl Gless. Can you tell us a little bit about him, if if uh, if that's okay? Yeah, no, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, Daryl uh, Daryl was a friend of mine on the faculty at UNC Chapel Hill. He was a professor of English for many years. was a was a very very popular uh, teacher and was a fine scholar, um, whom I knew a little bit uh, because he he. He worked in English, but he was interested in religion, especially in Shakespeare. And I'm obviously in the religious studies department, so we had some overlap. Uh, he became a friend when uh, I became chair of my department. He was the dean of my uh, he was he was the dean uh, at UNC, and uh, so I reported to him, and we became friends. So he contracted a, a rather miserable disease, uh, a blood a blood disease, and. Um, uh, for uh, for several years, was fighting this, and it ended up being a losing battle. During about well, less yeah, about a year before he died, um, I performed his wedding ceremony to a uh, I guess it was over a year uh, to to uh, to a woman who's now still a very good friend of mine. Uh, when Daryl died, um, she was eight months pregnant with their child. Uh, oh my! His uh, his goal had been to live until the child was born, uh, and that that didn't happen. So it was an extremely sad uh, event, uh, but it it was tinged with uh, real happiness too, because the uh, the the little girl uh, the the uh, the wife's name is Frida, and the little girl's name is is Lainey. Um, 
Lainey is just a real joy to her life now and is this beautiful girl. And so life, life coming out of death. And so for me, this was the perfect uh, person to dedicate the book to because, you know, I'm remembering him constantly and thinking about uh, our past together. Oh, that's really nice. I, I'm always interested in the story behind the dedications. Sometimes it's simply, you know, just a mom or whatever. Yeah. But yours is a little more detailed, and I, I wanted to hear even yeah. in more about yeah. it. Mm-hmm. There's uh, one last thing we wanted to ask you about, uh, Bart, was your um, your paid blog. Uh, yes. You mentioned in the uh, acknowledgments um, section of your book that you've set up this way for people who are interested in your writing uh, to get – uh, quite a bit of detailed content and do a little bit of good for the world at the same time. Yeah. So uh, I started this blog uh, nearly four years ago now. Um, and uh, every week I post five or six times uh, a week, about a thousand words a post. And I deal with everything having to do with early Christianity, from the historical Jesus to the Gospels to Paul to the other writings of the New Testament to the books that didn't make it into the New Testament to the Apostolic Fathers to up th- basically up through the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. Um, and so uh, the deal with this blog is people have to pay to join. Uh, it, it's uh, twenty four ninety five for a, a year membership. Um, but I don't use any of the money to line my own pockets. I actually pay for the expenses of the blog myself, and I give uh, every dime that I bring in to charity. So I've got uh, I've got four mm-hmm. charities that I support, and they all deal with issues of hunger and homelessness. Uh, and so uh, every year I've raised more and more money. Uh, so this past year, the blog is ra- the blog raised one hundred seventeen thousand uh, dollars. That's great. And- Wow! Yeah, yeah. So I, so people who are listening to the podcast, I hope they think about uh, joining up. All they need to do is look for the Barterman blog uh, online, and uh, and there are possibilities for shorter memberships for less money. But it's not much money. It's it's about it's about fifty cents a week uh, for getting you know a lot of information. And so mm-hmm. I think it's a good deal for everyone. And uh, basically, I do it as a way of raising money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, listen, uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, It was another very informative and enjoyable book. Maybe you'll uh, give us a four-peat at some point in the future. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Bart. Okay. Thank you. That was Dr. Bart D. Ehrman, author of Jesus Before the Gospels, How the Earliest Christians Remembered, Changed, and Invented Their Stories of the Savior. It's available in hardcover and an audiobook and for Kindle. We'll put a link in the show notes. For more about Bart and his work, visit Bart D. Ehrman, and that's E-H-R-M-A-N dot com.